literally recording this around the corner from Sing Street, which was my school when I was growing up. So, you went to Sing Street? A fellow alum, oh yeah. alumnus. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, first of all, congratulations on the movie. And uh, second of all, I was wondering if you could pass along a message to Joseph Gordon-Levitt just to let him, just to warn him that the entire world is going to fall in love with him once they see this movie because he is, uh, his character in this is just, it's adorable. It's It's been a long time since I've watched the movie and been like, everyone's going to love that guy. <laughs> yeah, he's a very likable, I mean, Joe's a very likable guy and very nice and very real and down to earth. He was a child star as well, so, you know, he could have gone off the rails, but he's actually a very grounded father and husband and a great collaborator. Um, I really, and it's, it wasn't a big part, if you think about it, he brought a great life and breath and wealth to that quite small character. You know, you could have, you could have done something simple with that, and he somehow really brought his experience of life in Los Angeles and the dreamers and the, the you know, the, the, the guitar player, all the amount of people who had these great dreams and are now sort of luxuriating in the hills in Hollywood. He, you know, that could have been a cliche and probably was the way I wrote it, but he managed to sort of invest it, as you say, there with a poignancy and a truth. And uh, yeah, he, you know, helped create a great character there. Well, this... It de- I was, I was, I've been keeping a close eye on it. It debuted in, correct me if I'm wrong, it was January this year at Sundance. Yeah. And it got this like rapturous uh, applause. And uh, I was reading all the reactions to it. And I was like, oh my God, because this was ahead of the Oscars this year. So it, it almost felt like, so we had Banshees and we had After Sun, we had Paul Mescal and Barry Kilgore, and all the, the spotlight and Irish attention. And then we had Florence one that was already gearing up for another incredible year for Irish cinema. Yeah. From your perspective, is that something you're noticing, the, the, the huge, massive uptick in international, I guess, appeal for Irish cinema? You could not see it. You know, it's evident. I mean, it was like, we were ju- just laughing the other day, like Ed Guiney's just won the thing in Venice. You know, every other, you know, you, you could th- you'd throw a stone at the Oscars, you know, hit some, some fella from Dublin. Um, um, uh, and it, 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 back in the old days, it was like, do you remember, it would be like one thing, one costume designer or director managed to get a nomination or now it feels, but I think that's part of the kind of globalization and the universal, um, hunger for other stories now, now that the internet has opened that up and streaming and that we actually now realize we don't want the same just uh, we don't just want hollywood or we don't just want this genre or there's a great openness now i think to m- stories from around the world and i think that's coincided with the natural dublin ireland storyteller which we're famous for in literary terms or poetic or music terms now we're getting there cinematically finally and um it's palpable you know you can see it everywhere uh, it's it's interesting as well because this is it's an Apple TV movie. I believe your last project w- was with uh, was with Amazon, uh, and just off off the back of what you're saying there, like the the biggest TV show ever, I think at the moment or the last few years, anyways, like Squid Game. It's this huge international thing, and everyone has to rise in it. Yeah. So it, you're, you're absolutely correct in that that the appeal of internationality is is honed in. Yeah. But for yourself, how have you found working with Amazon and on this working with Apple? It, it is that kind of a big change in terms of what you were doing even 10 years ago. Oh, massive change. Yeah, huge, huge change. And it's funny that those, that, that some of the, you know, um, uh, tech companies are, are, are more open than, this, than the traditional studios were to interna- being international and, and reaching different territories, different languages. And the real good news about it is that, firstly, people don't mind reading. They don't mind subtitles and that they are increasingly open to to the stories from around the world, different opinions and nuances, not abroad, because it's, we, you know, universality is, is a bit of a dream. You, you couldn't have, for me, the better a thing is, the more nuanced it is. You know, for me personally, I love the details and the specifics. 
And I don't like generalizations. And I think for a long time, Hollywood was guilty of these incredible touristic cliches of you are Italian or you're an Irish fellow or, you know, the cliches, the awful things about, you know, um, just very one dimensional versions of the world in movies that, that traveled around the world or were filmed in different regions. And now that's really turned. And um, Squid Game is a great example. But there's so many examples of like, wow, that's what happens there. And this is the way people talk. And there's very subtle differences in communication. And that seems to be um, the way things are going, which is kind of great. It's really great for me because I think I've found now in screenings of this film, and we found this with Once, but, but more so with Once, when I brought that film to America, people were still going, what did he say? Well, what's the guy talking about? I, I can't hear a word. Now you get people saying, what, what is it? But I don't care. I don't really care. I don't need to hear everything she said and follow the plot in this because it's not a plotty thing. It's a tonal little snippet of Dublin life. It's like, bring it on. I, 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 you know, they, people don't care as much that they're missing some of this stuff. They just, they're in to try and find, to have an experience that's really like getting off a plane, not just... Not, not just a virtual Hollywood version of Italy or Ireland or South Korea, but actually get off a plane and go in and meet the people and have an experience there. Well, one thing I was really impressed by is that um, this movie is very reflective of the current Irish music scene in that you do see a lot more Irish hip hop artists and a lot more Irish uh, dance artists Mm -hmm. uh, breaking breaking their way into the mainstream because normally we yeah. was very singer songwriter for yes. decades. That's what we did. All we had rock. Yeah. Whereas now it is it's it's far more eclectic because Ireland itself has become far more eclectic and more of a melting pot kind of vibe. For you, for the songs for this, were there any particular maybe new or younger or any at all musicians within the different genres that were a touchstone for the new songs in this movie? Definitely. I was, I was, it took a long time to, and you're, you're, I'm glad you observed, I didn't want to do the singer songwriter thing in this. You know, I didn't want him to be like a junior Ed Sheeran with a little acoustic or whatever, or a ukulele. I didn't want him to be experimenting with like traditional Irish music through, through rock or something like that. I kind of wanted to figure out a way that I could have them be a bit different and without specifying artists that he's listening to imagine that he's spending time googling people in dublin in the flats in tala in kulak the different bands bit of drill some electronica that's going on over here in this in this estate oh there's a bloke here from leeds who's doing some mad kind of like angry hip-hop or some gnarly drill <laughs> music you know Without naming them, I wanted to pull all that in and make, but then maybe he's going back to the 80s and listening to, or, or, or you know, listening to Orbital, listening to stuff from the early noughties or the late 90s. But without, I didn't want him to be like name checking. I wanted you to get a sense from that, from the kid. Oh, I can hear little bits and pieces of these things. But Flora can also come in with an acoustic guitar and put a G chord over that that she's just learned. And it actually, oh, that's really interesting because you've got this weird ar 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 arpeggio going on garage band with a loop and a beat, but it's really cool to throw an acoustic guitar in over that. It's wrong, but it actually works quite well. And it creates a little bit of a new sound. Now, I'm not saying I'm inventing new music or anything in this film, but it had to feel like the songs that you hear in the movie are coming from Flora and her son and Jeff and that's kind of it. You know, there's no strings come in. They don't get to go to a big recording studio. It has to sound like they made it with a girl who knows eight chords and a shit guitar that she found in a skip, a lad in LA who didn't make it as a singer songwriter and a kid who's, you know, looking at all of these influences that we just talked about going <laughs> on his keyboard. And that, that sound had to, you had to listen to that and go, I love this. This is great. I'd love to be in that pub with her at the end. Well, you succeeded because I absolutely did want to be in that pub with them at the end. Great. Uh, John, thank you so much for your time today and congrats again on the movie. 
A pleasure. Have a nice walk around Camden Street there. I can't wait to get home now from uh, from this little tour. Playing the guitar, it's so sexy. Okay. Is that why you took it up? Well, let's focus on you. Are you coming on to me?